Coming up, we've got a beautiful 4K monitor from Acer. Megan Maroney tries her hand at sound bending. And Miriam Girard is here to review a phone that's not a Lumia. You gotta watch before you buy. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Before You Buy is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Before You Buy is brought to you by Little Bits, the easy way to build electronics with modular building blocks. Go to littlebits.com slash before you buy and you'll receive $20 off your first kit plus free shipping in the United States. And buy FreshBooks, the super simple cloud accounting and invoicing solution designed to help small business owners save time, billing, and get paid faster. Try it free at freshbooks.com slash BYB. Welcome to Before You Buy. It's the Twitch show where we take the knickknacks that we find here at the Twit Brick House and we give it to members of the Twit Army, to staff, to host, to co-host, to guest, to give us an honest opinion of whether or not they would buy, try, or not buy it at all. I'm here with Miriam Joar. Miriam, you Hello. are often a guest on Before You yes, Buy. Yes, pretty regularly it seems. You have all the techs. A lot of it. You have a lot of the techs. A and uh, today you've brought us something that's not, I'm not going to say it's out of your wheelhouse because your wheelhouse is all phones, <laughs> but it's away from what we normally see you with, which are high-end Lumias yeah, or their exactly. new Lumias. This is a Huawei. Yes, and not just a Huawei, it's a Huawei that is legally and officially <laughs> sold in the U.S. by Huawei with a website, with a guarantee, a warranty, and... Uh, I think they have like technical support you can call 24-7 even. Well, which is, if anyone here has bought a Huawei, which some of them are actually very nice phones, they're always, they're bought in another country because right. they don't sell them in the United States. So this is actually a yeah. U.S. version. Yeah, and it's unlocked, so that's the big difference. It's not a carrier branded phone. Like, we've had a lot of, lot of Huawei phones that are supported by the carriers, right? Like, you buy it from the carrier, you get your warranty and your uh, support from the carriers, but this one is an unlocked, it's an, and it's a mid-range phone. This so is the Huawei P P8 Lite. Link, Link Lite. 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 Okay. So the P8 Lite uh, is based on the P8, which is a flagship phone from Huawei, which is unfortunately not sold in the US. And it's a bigger phone, the P8, than this. This is a 5-inch display. I think the P8 might be a 5.2 or 5.5. And the P8 is metal. And they've so, you know, in the same way as you have, um, like, the Samsung Galaxy S4 S and then ah, the S4... Uh, whatever it's called, mini, right. right? So this is kind of a miniaturized, slightly miniaturized version of the P8. Slightly and, less expensive, and also, I would And also, like, spec-wise miniaturized, okay. so, right. so a little lesser. So let's, let's talk specs a little bit. Um, it, first of all, it looks really cool, as you can see. It's a beautiful... Um, it, it looks pretty nice if you just look at it. And then if you pick it up, you really quickly realize it's all plastic, but really well done plastic. So a little disappointed uh, compared to, like, say, the... The original PA, which You'd like is to all keep the metal, aluminum. right? Yeah. It'd be nice. Uh, now, you know, before we talk about, uh, you know, we get too carried away, is this $250 unlocked? So, you know, set your expectations right there. I don't really want to knock them for using plastics at $250 unlocked because the, the whole package is really quite nice. So, specs, 5-inch display. It's only a 720p display. Right. I, I, I noticed, it, yeah, it's not as sharp as some of the screens I've but seen. But it is IPS. By the way, I'm running the uh, Google Now launcher here, not the Huawei launcher. But as you can see, so the Huawei launcher doesn't actually have an app tray, very similar to a lot of Chinese phones. The apps just live on your home screens. Uh, and you get uh, how did you get screen. the vanilla Google launcher? Oh, can you turn it off? Or do you have to? You can turn it off. Oh, like okay, I nice. installed it. It's big. Remember, this phone is sold with Play Store support right out of the box. So I just went in the Play Store and installed it. In fact, I'm going to go right now and change it to the default launcher so you can have a look at what it looks so like. So it's, it's not one of these annoying skins that demands you use the skin. No, not at all. all right. um, and uh, if you know, if I go into the apps here, I can actually change which are the default apps. I just have to find my way through the menus. Lots of uh, it's an you know how it goes. Lots of menus. So, um, in terms of specs inside, you'll find uh, a Snapdragon 615. Okay. So that is a mid-range. Uh, so dual core. Um, it's, I believe, quad, quad core. core? Okay. Yeah, quad core. And so uh, here, default app settings. As you can see, here are the default apps and the launcher at the top here. I can change to Huawei Home, 
And if I hit the home button at this point, I'm in the Huawei launcher. And that's what it looks like. So you can have a look. This is the, the default experience from Huawei. And here are all my apps, right, right there. That's There's not, no app tree yeah. anymore, right? It just, as you can see. So um, that's basically how, how this works. And I'll change it back to What to kind of Google. bands are we talking about here? So this is what's interesting about this phone. It comes with all the bands you would need in the US for both HSP plus LTE and of course Edge basic right. GSM. But it's a dual SIM phone with dual LTE oh. support. Um, and it has two SIM slots, if you look carefully right here on the Edge, uh, one and two. Uh, this top one here is a dual purpose slot. It has a micro SD card slot on it. Okay. So you can either use one SIM and a micro SD or you can do two SIMs. And the second SIM, so this SIM on the micro SD card slot is actually a nano SIM, whereas the main SIM is a micro SIM. Right. But you could run this with Timo and AT&T simultaneously and have two numbers and pick which of the two SIMs do your data nice. and which of your two SIMs do the calls and texts. You know, the funny thing is I see that feature a lot, that dual SIM feature, but only in the less expensive phones. The flagship phones almost never have that. Right, <laughs> so um, since we're on the edge here, if you want to zoom in again, uh, you can see there's a volume rocker here and a power lock key. That power lock key actually looks really nice. It's kind of looks like it's a brush. That is plastic, spun. that's not an aluminum um, band. This right? is actually, it might be an aluminum. The key might be aluminum. I'm pretty sure the volume rocker is plastic mm. and the, the entire rim, the band is all plastic. Okay. Okay. And that's what I was saying, like the original P8 is metal there. Um, You've got a five megapixel front facing camera uh, to complement this five inch display. As I said, the five inch display is 720p, but it's IPS. It could potentially be a little brighter in direct sunlight. I was in Israel recently and it was, it was struggling a bit in direct sunlight. Uh, but it worked great with uh, Sims from Israel because it's completely unlocked. Uh, in the back, you have a 13 megapixel camera. It is uh, autofocus, does not have OIS. But here's cool. what's cool about it. It's f over 2.0. So oh. it has a pretty fast f-stop. Yeah, so, so it does pretty decent in low light. Be, yeah, it does OK. Um, and it comes with a refocus feature. So you can focus after the after fact. The fact yeah. that's it's very not as good cool. as the one on the Honor 6 Plus that I reviewed right. when Leo was still hosting the show a while back. Uh, that one uses two cameras to actually create a, a full like variable aperture. Yeah, this is this more this is, is a software trick. It's a software okay. trick. Um, dual LED flash, as you can see, and it, this does not have a removable back cover. So the only way you can get in is through the SIM slot and a micro SD slot here. How about sound quality reception? Were you having um, any issues? All of it, no problem. Sounds uh, uh, are clear. The music playback is, you know, pretty much what you'd expect from a mono speaker firing from the bottom. You can see there's a micro uh, USB uh, charge and data port. On top, you have obviously a headphone jack. You can see how thin this phone is. Here. I don't know if uh, the headphone jack gives you a, a sense of scale here. Right. It's, it's, it's a just pretty barely thin phone. bigger like than a headphone jack. Six and a half, seven millimeter. It's about the same as an iPhone. Uh, um, I, I have to ask you this because it is a less expensive phone, and as you said, you know it's it's been downplated to plastic instead of aluminum. Uh, people are going to ask. Is it solid? Does it feel it sturdy? It feels really nice. So that's the thing, is that they've maintained the look and feel of the original P8, but they've actually downgraded the material. So okay. if, you, if you start looking close up, actually, I really had to figure out if this was plastic or not. The best way to do it was to leave it in, an, like, in front of the air conditioned duct in my car <laughs> and then touch it, and I felt that it wasn't getting quite as cold as I expected. Right. But it's so it's, that's how well it's done. Like, it's done well enough that you don't know. Uh, two gigs of RAM, 16 gigs of built-in storage. Remember, yeah. you have micro SD right. for expansion. Snapdragon 615, uh, which is a pretty snappy mid-range processor, capable of running uh, Android f uh, at 64-bit, which is great. This, by the way, unfortunately does not run Lollipop. So it comes out of the box with Android 4.4. And that's one of the things that I wish that Huawei would uh, do better. Most of their phones right now are not running Lollipop out of the box. Right. So did, did they build NFC into this thing? No. So no. there's another okay. thing. Thanks for bringing that up. Because that's actually one of the things that I wish it had that mm. is lacking. I mean, it's not something you use really for more than just pairing Bluetooth devices these days. Who actually uses uh, you know Google Wallet to pay for stuff? I've used it once, maybe. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, it's not like going to be a, a make it or break it feature, I think, for most people to not have NFC, but it does It does not have NFC. Um, but the camera is great. The display is great. Performance is good. Uh, and the price is really reasonable. The only thing that kind of makes it a bit of a, hmm, 
you know, think twice is you can probably buy a OnePlus One. I, we all know the OnePlus yes. Two is coming, yes. but you can probably buy a OnePlus One right now for 250 300 And at that price point, really, frankly, the OnePlus One is, is going to be a better deal. It's also going to be a bigger phone. Yeah, it's a bigger phone. It, so, it does have things like NFC. So, you know, um, it's obviously a flagship phone. It's got Snapdragon, you know, 801 or whatever. Uh, a different beast, a different beast. But what I'm trying to say is that if you're looking at this purely from a cost point of view, you know, you can probably use yes, Moto G is another good alternative. You know, you've all have a, a bunch of choices in the $250 range. But I think that in absolute value, it's it's a good value. All right, let's break it down. Give me, give me down. the con your, your top three cons and your top three pros. So top three cons, no NFC, mm -hmm. uh, plastic, completely plastic okay. build, even though it's really well made. Um, and the third one, again, the price, arguably, you know, there's going to be some other choices in that price range. Uh, the pros is great display, great camera, and more importantly, an unlocked phone with full support from the manufacturer in the US for $250. And, and dual SIM. <laughs> and dual SIM. So dual if SIM. you want to go crazy and have your work SIM and your uh, personal SIM in there, you can do that. Miriam, moment of truth. It's a buy to me because, you know, we need more unlocked devices from manufacturers that are other than the main manufacturers, right? Actually, most of the main manufacturers actually don't sell their devices unlocked unless you get Google Play editions and stuff. So unlocked device gets my gets my buy every time. And this one is a pretty decent mid-ranger. I would actually rock this phone and use it every day. There you have it. That's the word. It's a buy for the Huawei P8 Lite. Lite. It may not be their flagship, but it's pretty dang close. And at $250... It's not bad for a dual SIM unlocked phone. Of course, you can find Miriam all over the Twit TV network. That's you'll, right. You'll find her on All About Android to guest quite a bit. She'll be here basically either every week or every other week on Before You Buy. I, uh, I haven't talked to Jason yet, but I'm hoping to be here right after the OnePlus 2 launches yes. because I will be at the launch event. Oh, okay. So uh, will you have some um, eye candy for I us? will have, I don't think we're going to get devices to take home. Of course not. But I will have photos and videos and I will have played with it. So I'll have an idea what's going on. So stay tuned for that. And if they want to find you when you're not on the Twit TV, <laughs> TV network, there is, of course, a great place to find you. Yes. So my the best thing is to follow me on Twitter. Uh, my hand is Tank Girl without the vowels. That's T N K G R L. And my blog is tnkgrl.com. You'll find some uh, YouTube reviews of devices that I'm not reviewing for uh, BYB. And you'll find some my podcast, which is on there as well. So go check it out. Uh, just look, Google Tank Girl, drop the vowels, T N K G R L. That's me online. And you're you're going to find her. She's uh, here all the time, giving us the latest and the greatest, especially in the mobile space. Now, Miriam, let me ask you something. Yeah. Uh, I am I consider myself a maker. I mean, I'm not a great maker, but I do like to tinker with things. Are, are you a tinkerer? Yes, I do uh, play with stuff a lot. Well, you know, we, we do actually have a sponsor of Before You Buy who wants to encourage tinkering. And not just encourage tinkering, but encourage tinkering in a family unit. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a way for you to expose your children at a very early age to the wonders of building things. Let me guess. You're talking about little bits. Little bits. Exactly. Wow. That's, we're, we're like on the, the, the same document here. Now, Little Bits is a, a company that gives you kits. Kits that allow your kids to learn. Now, it would be one thing if you had book learning and another thing if maybe you had some instructional videos. But what would you do? If you had just a collection of bits, of, of gadgets, of gizmos, of things that you could put together easily to show your kids everything about motors and electronics and sound and LEDs. Well, you used to have Radio Shack for that, but that's kind of debatable because even then you had to deal with soldering irons and such. Not so with little bits. Take a look at what's what's inside this. Now, this is, the, I like this one. This one is the space kit. Uh, the, the cool thing about this is it was designed for, you know, people who want to play around with some NASA technology. It's, it's sort of themed. But the one that I really like is this. This is an 18 bits kit. Now, this is how it works. You have all these different modules. Now, each of the modules are color-coded, and uh, they do different things. Like, for example, I can have speakers. I can have LED lights. I can have sensors. I could have connections to, to servo motors. Uh, in order to connect these, you just put them together. Now, you'll notice that these won't go together. It's because they're magnetic. It's telling me, no, no, that doesn't go that way. So I flip it around, and now I'm good to go. Yep. It's easy as that. You can, you can have your kids design a circuit. They could put together something that uses, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, how about a light a light sensor along with a, a motor uh, and then give it a power source and watch it go. The, the nice thing about the, the Little Bits kit is it's not necessarily telling them what to build, it's just telling them 
build something. And I gotta like that. As a maker, I highly recommend it. A Little Bits lets everyone use electronics as Lego blocks, modular building blocks. They snap together with those magnets so your kids can have a sense of accomplishment without getting frustrated that things aren't working the first or the second or the twelfth time that they try it. They've got over 60 modules that can be used in virtually limitless creative combinations. And because we live in a tech-driven world, this is a way for them to explore what we here on the Twit TV network call the fundamentals. It's not enough, no longer enough, just to be able to use technology. You got to know what drives it. You got to know what makes it happen. You got to know how to build it. And Little Bits can help you teach your kids. Uh, it is a great way to in introduce them to electronics and inspire creativity, to, to, to invoke the hacker spirit, using something in a way that it wasn't intended to be used. Those are all the values that Little Bits tries to instill in your kids. And you know what? Believe it or not, when you try to inspire your kids, you're going to get inspired yourself. Now, for the tinkerer, I would recommend something like the, the Deluxe Kit. It has 18 modules that snap together with billions of circuit combinations. Now, if you're a musician, try the Synth Kit. The Synth Kit is their modular analog synthesizers. Now, novices and experts alike can easily create music using little bit uh, oscillators, filters, envelope, keyboard, microsequencer, and speakers. And for the programmer, if they're starting to get into Arduino, well, you can encourage that even further. They've got the Little Bits Arduino Coding Kit that gives you everything you need to get started with electronics and programming using Arduino. Now, are you sold? Because you should be. Because this is something you should want. If you watch Twit TV, there's no reason why you wouldn't want one of these in your life, especially if you have kids to teach. And right now, Little Bits is offering new customers $20 off their first kit. Go to littlebits.com slash before you buy. That's littlebits.com slash before you buy. Plus, you get free shipping in the United States. Once again, that's littlebits.com slash before you buy. Learn now. Learn big with Little Bits. And we thank Little Bits for their support of Before You Buy. Now, again, thank you very much for, uh, for being here. You know, You're it's, welcome. it's always fun. But I think it's time for us maybe to move on to something a little bit different. We had our phone, which is great, but uh, now I'd like to take to the skies. We asked Trey Ratcliffe to give us his impressions on the new DJI Phantom 3. Hello, I am Trey Ratcliffe. I'm here to talk to you today about the Phantom 3 from DJI. Um, I've been using these Phantom cameras forever. These are the quadcopter flying systems. I started with the Phantom 1, then I went to the Phantom 2, and that had the, uh, the GoPro attachment, and there was another kind of built-in camera. And now the Phantom 3s come out. But right in between the Phantom 2 and Phantom 3, the Inspire came out, which was like a, a bigger quadcopter with this very professional uh, camera system. So the great thing about the Phantom 3 is it has the same camera system as the Inspire, probably just for a fraction of the price. And so this is not really a comparison between the Inspire and the Phantom 3 because they're still very different machines. I think I might use the Inspire in a much more uh, professional way. Uh, the Inspire could do some cool things that the Phantom can't. For example, with the Inspire, you can have a second cameraman that's moving the camera independently. Um, also, the legs come up on the Inspire. Um, I flew this thing actually with uh, Kai in, uh, in Hong Kong. We had a, a ton of fun with it. But what's so cool when these legs come up is that the camera can do 360 degrees around and you never see the legs. So that's, that's pretty awesome. So with the Phantom 3, um, it's at a cheaper price point. It's uh, about twelve, thirteen hundred dollars, and the camera basically is always facing straight ahead. So whichever way you want to film, you kind of have to be flying in that direction or pointing in that direction. Uh, but it's got an amazing camera system. It's all 4K. Um, if you want to take photos, that's what I love to do with the drones in particular. Uh, it takes 12 megapixel raw photos, and you have total manual control. That means you can set uh, the ISO. Uh, you can set the um, uh, the aperture, you can set the shutter speed, all that kind of stuff. Not only that, but you could do auto bracketing. So if you want to do HDR shots from the sky, I'd love to do that. That's super cool. Uh, these things are so stable, you could take a series of photos, like burst photos as you're turning, and you can make a wide panorama. So it's just an unbelievable machine. Uh, it's really easy to travel with. I just chuck it in my bag and just kind of wrap some clothes up around it, and it, it travels just fine. So my recommendation on this one is definitely a buy. That one's kind of a no-brainer. I mean, the Phantom 3 is getting rave reviews. People really like it. And if you were thinking about getting a, a Phantom 2 or 
maybe even a Phantom One. Don't, don't even consider it because seriously, you're going to love the quality of the camera in the new three. So that's Trey Ratcliffe with the DJI Phantom 3. If you are looking for an out of the box quadcopter that can give you some professional looking photo and video, he gives it a buy. Uh, let's go ahead and move from quadcopters to something that's a bit more grounded, something that all of you will want to be doing in the near future, and that is upgrading your monitor to a 4K unit. It's gonna happen, folks. Yes, I mean, 1080p is fine for most things, but I'm finding more and more that just having a little bit of extra real estate along with some extra pixelage makes for a better desktop. And, uh, well, we've got a doozy here. This is something we had a first look at a while back. It's the Acer S277HK. It's what they think you should have on your desktop. The S277HK, or what Acer affectionately calls the S7 monitor, is a 27-inch 4K UHD with unique styling, a set of nice specs, and a sub-$600 price tag. Let's start with the specs. The S7 sports a non-gloss 16x9, 3840x2160, 27-inch IPS panel with 300 nits of brightness and a 4 millisecond response time. The panel is far above average, well-saturated, evenly lit, well-defined enough for fine graphics work, and fast enough for gaming. The contrast was a little mediocre, and it's not the brightest monitor that I've tested, but the color reproduction was excellent, and the non-gloss finish more than makes up for the somewhat anemic backlight. The IPS panel delivers 178 degrees of viewing angle in both the X and Y axes, along with a 60 Hz refresh rate at 4K, while consuming less than 50 watts of power. A set of 2 watt speakers at the rear of the monitor provide passable stereo desktop sound. They're loud, but not surprisingly, they lack bass punch. To the rear, you'll also find the S7's ports, which include DVI, HDMI 2.0, DisplayPort, Mini DisplayPort, and a 3.5mm audio jack. The port panel is clean, but its location does mean that the rear of the monitor is guaranteed to look cluttered with multiple cables. Beyond the specs, the design of the S7 is also worthy of note. The S7 has a near bezel-less design, which makes it perfect in a side-by-side -side two- or three-monitor setup. Unlike some of the other low-cost 27-inch high-resolution monitors that I've tested, the S7 actually has an extremely sturdy build with no flexing, detachment of the bezel from the panel, or a cheap feel. Controls are found at the bottom right edge of the monitor. Just look for the glowing blue power button. From there, you can toggle between modes, adjust brightness and color, change volume, and turn on picture-in-picture. -picture. I was a little put off by the lack of labels, but the on-screen display was easy to navigate, and I quickly became adept at using the disappearing controls. One of the more striking features is the base. Offset, made of brushed aluminum and created with an industrial look. The base weighs down the S7 while also giving it 20 degrees of tilt. It's a nice enough design and it worked well during the testing period, but the lack of a swivel or height adjustment occasionally brought frustration, especially since there's no VESA mount. In all, the S7 is a fantastic performer for a 4K monitor under $600. It has a few quirks in physical design that should be corrected in the next version, but an above-average feature set and a stellar reproduction performance just might push its score over the top. The Acer S277HK is available now with a three-year warranty. You can find it on the street for about $575. I should mention that that street price I have seen as low as about $510. So you could get one of these for, for really not a whole lot, especially when you consider how much is packed in. Now let's go ahead and start with the cons. The first con has to be the fact that it doesn't have a VESA mount. I was really hoping for that because this mount, while stylish and nice, and it does give me this 20 degrees of tilt, has an issue in that it doesn't swivel and it doesn't raise or lower. So if you're looking for a lot of adjustability or if you have one of these weird desktops that kind of wants the monitor to be at a different height, you're going to be out of luck. Also, because it's got this wonderful zero bezel so that, I mean, I can imagine putting two or three of these together, I would really like to use that in a mount so I could position them exactly where I want. The other thing is the sound. Now, this actually isn't a big thing for me because I don't expect really good sound out of a monitor. It's passable, but it is kind of weak. Now, on the good side, there is an output. So you can output to your speakers, which means you don't have to be stuck with with the not so great sounding, not really powerful kind of drippy, tinny speakers in the back of the monitor. But again, yeah, that, that is a con. Now let's go to the pros. The first thing is price. This is priced well below most monitors that I would get with these capabilities. It's not the cheapest 4K monitor out there, 
but I would, I would argue that it's probably the least expensive 4K monitor that has everything I'm looking for. Now, the feature set is great. It does have a lot of ports. The people in the chat room are joking that it has DVI. Some people still do use DVI, especially since I can do picture in picture. I can run multiple desktops, multiple inputs off of one display, which means I'm gonna want as many input options as I could possibly have. But the number one thing for me, the thing that sets this aside from the same kinds of monitors, the same price point monitors that I've seen from Dell and others is the color reproduction. They deliberately did not put an ultra glossy surface, even though they, met, they knew that that was gonna reduce the brightness. It also meant that it wasn't gonna have that, that power, that grabbing power that you see when some of these monitors are in a display room and they're turned all the way up. That glossiness does make the color pop, but it also makes the color reproduction incredibly, incredibly inaccurate. By going with this non-gloss, almost matte finish, what this will give you is if you are a creative professional, you'll have something that is as close to perfect as possible. At this price point, you ain't gonna find anything like that. In fact, you're gonna have to go up to the 800, 900, maybe even a thousand dollar level to get a 4K monitor that will do the same. So, all in all, really nice monitor. If I had to give it a try, a buy, or a don't buy, I'd say that the Acer S7, model number S277HK, is a definite buy. All right, now when we come back, we're gonna have uh, a little bit of fun. We've gotta take a look at a Synology review from Lou Maresca, that's right, my, my co-host on Coding 101, and then Megan is gonna try her hand at doing a little bit of sound bending. But before we do that, let's go ahead and thank the second sponsor of this episode of Before You Buy. And specifically, I wanna reach out to all you folks out there who are running a small business or maybe trying to go it alone. If you are, then you understand how difficult it is, how annoying it is to keep all your invoicing in line, all your finances, everything ordered, everything correct, everything ready to be processed. Well, you could hire a bookkeeper or maybe you wanna do it yourself and possibly miss out on collecting on an invoice. I, I've actually done that myself. Or you could go with FreshBooks. FreshBooks makes it easy for everyone to handle their finances. Now, FreshBooks is the invoicing solution that makes it incredibly simple for freelancers to create and send invoices, track their time and manage their expenses. And get this, they want you to try it free for 30 days. Uh, during your free trial, you'll immediately understand why over 5 million people use FreshBooks to keep their small businesses running smoothly. It's incredibly easy to use, even for those of us who feel like a fish out of water when working with numbers. It just does everything automatically. You tell it that you had a job, that you billed this much, that this customer needs to pay at this time, and it will generate the invoices as they need to be sent out. How cool is that? Now, FreshBooks was designed especially for people who prefer to focus on their work and not their billing. Anyone who's been building a business knows that there comes a point, I've, I experienced this myself, when the financial part is now starting to take away from your resources, from your energy that you wanna be putting into creative or in productive work, FreshBooks lets you get back to that. Now, help is free at FreshBooks forever, and you can always count on their award-winning support. They have rock stars that go above and beyond whenever you need a hand. So why aren't you using them? If you don't use FreshBooks right now, if you are running your own business, if you are a creative professional who needs to bill and to invoice and you're not using FreshBooks, it means that you're just cheating yourself out of the life of luxury and leisure. Now getting started is simple and it's totally free for 30 days with no obligation. Go to freshbooks.com BYB. That's freshbooks.com BYB. And don't forget to enter the code before you buy in the how did you hear about us section. Start your 30-day free trial today, and we thank FreshBooks for their support of Before You Buy. Let's get back into it. Uh, we decided to give uh, one of the newest members of the Twit TV hosting army, Mr. Lou Maresca, a Synology NAS to run it through its paces. He brought it up to Seattle, and, uh, well, this is what he found. I'm Luis Moresca, co-host of Cutting 101 with Father Robert Ballister, and today we are talking about network-attached storage. This specific NAS unit is the Synology DS214 SE 2300 it is a home to small office entry level unit. Those of you who are not familiar with NAS, primarily network attached storage is to host up files or serve up files on your network. And even though it doesn't sound the most exciting thing in the world, if you've ever lost anything or forgot to back something up, network attached storage can literally save your life when it comes to backing up really important documents, video files, photos, so on and so forth. If you've ever shared anything on your computer before, network attached storage is a similar concept. The operating system will serve up 
uh, set of files, whether it's in be make it accessible across devices, platforms, operating systems, that kind of thing. This specific unit, the DS214 SE, um, comes with two three terabyte drives. They are NAS drives, Seagate drives, really kind of great drives actually for an entry level unit. They come in actually RAID 1 or mirrored configuration, which means that the data that's on the first drive is actually mirrored or copied to the second drive. It really gives you peace of mind when it comes to making sure that you have redundancy in your data. Or if, if you ever had a drive fail on you before, I sure have, um, you want to make sure that having backup of the data is very important. And it makes it really easy to actually replace the drive. If one of the drives fails, you turn the unit off, you pop the unit open with just two screws on the back. You slide out the old drive, slide in a new drive, and boom, you immediately get copying of data from the first drive to the second drive. It's really easy to kind of get it set up. This specific unit comes with 256 megs of DDR3 RAM, comes with a Armada 37, 370 CPU, it's 800 megahertz. Um, it comes with really low power consumption and it also comes with an open source operating system called Disk Station Manager. So it's a really great operating system when it comes to actually uh, applications and packages put on it. Comparably to other Synology units, you know, some of them like, for instance, it's Big Brother, the 215 Plus. It will come with one gigabyte of RAM. It comes with a dual core processor. Even the 415 Plus with it comes with a quad core 2.4 gigahertz processor and two gigas of RAM. So again, again, this is just an entry level unit, but it really has some great features to it when it comes to entry level. Um, on the back of the unit, there are two USB 2.0 ports. Not really sure what use, how useful these ports will be. Again, because if you've ever backed up data or served up data on a USB 2.0 port before, it's going to take you a while. So I'm not really sure how useful those are from an external storage to backup capability, but they can be used for a print server. But if you have a newer router on your in your network, those routers sometimes have USB ports to plug in a printer so and serve up as a printer. So again, not really sure how useful they would be from a USB perspective, but they are there if you need them. Again, this unit is pretty easy to set up. Um, again, if you wanted to replace the drives, just two screws in the back, the drive easily slides open and you can see immediately inside there's those two three terabyte drives. They again, they're Seagate NAS drives. These drives run at 5,900 RPM consistent rate, really great performance out of those drives. Some of the other Synology units come with the uh, Western digital red drives installed on them. They don't necessarily have the greatest performance in the world. Um, again, some of them come with the, the, um, the green drives. Those drives are again, not necessarily the best performance in the world. They can range from 5,400 to 6,000 RPM when it comes to the spinning of the drive, and they don't necessarily get the best performance, but they do get pretty good power consumption. But these drives are actually better from a performance perspective. Services installed on the unit, it comes with a backup service, very similar to Time Backup on OS X, uh, the file history on Windows, antivirus package, comes with media server, also comes with uh, business services like um, mail server or even um, a voice communication server for routing calls, Node.js server. So it comes with really kind of great services right out of the box. So pros, right out of the box, this unit comes with pre-installed hard drives. And that makes for an advantage over some of the other economical startup units. I'd say definite pro for this unit. Another pro, this special edition unit comes with two three terabyte drives in RAID 1 or mirror configuration. Again, it gives you that peace of mind when it comes to backing up your data. Third pro is this is, a unit is actually pretty fast comparably to some of the other economic units. So I'd say definite pro for this unit. And finally, what's a plus for this unit is the super fast and easy setup time. In a couple minutes, you're up and running and ready to go. Cons, this unit doesn't have wake on land support. And that can use be useful for not utilizing so much power when it comes to when you're not using the unit. If you want to use it a VPN server, sometimes having wake on lands useful for using lowest lower power. Also, the chassis is a bit flimsy. So if I'm opening and closing the unit a bunch of times, I'd be worried that potentially I could actually crack or break the unit. But hopefully those good drives on the inside will mean that I don't have to open it as many, many times. The USB 2.0 ports on the back. Another con is that not very useful. Again, not be unless you're going to use it as a print server, not very good for backing up data. Doesn't have eSATA, doesn't have USB 3.0, so not very useful from that perspective. Final con, only 256 megs of RAM. So if you're going to be using it for a communication server or serving up video, DLNA, doing that all at once, mail server, you could potentially run out of system memory. But again, it, it is an economical entry level unit and it can be very useful if you're not going to be utilizing it for that much. I would say a definite buy for this unit. As an entry level unit, it comes with a ton of services, had a great great hardware on the inside, those two ter three terabyte drives and RAID configuration, a great startup unit for NAS. 
Again, I'm Luis Moresca from Coding 101, and this is the Synology DS214 SE. It's a buy for the Synology DS214 from Lou Moresca. Now, I, I have to say, the uh, the DSM operating system that runs on all Synology NASs, I really, really like it. I, I've tried QNAP, I've tried Synology, I've tried Netgear, and bar none, it is the best. I, I think we'll, we'll probably go more in depth on a couple of arrays in the future. We want to thank Lou Moresca. Of course, you'll find him every, what is that, Monday, 2.30 p.m. with me for Coding 101. Come get your code on with uh, two geeks who like to play with code. Now, uh, you know, we've got a different kind of geek on the stage today. That's right, the one, <laughs> the only, Megan Maroney. And Megan, I've heard that you have practiced the ancient art of sound bending. That sounds really I bad. have not, but, uh, you know, when they gave me this to review, I thought, what, what, <laughs> what, like, what do you think of me? Like, for a that? minute, I was like, really? Like, a piece of plastic? That's a product. But I get it, because it's an iOS product, and I do a lot of the iOS okay. shows, so... Um, so that's why they gave it to me, and I understand that. Oh, so what is this supposed to? It looks. This, it, this looks like the packaging that something comes in. No, this is the sound bender, and it was invented uh, by a home inventor, uh, a, a man with three children. I um, am, you know, always excited about the parent inventors. It's supposed to turn up the sound on your iPad. So this small sound bender here is uh, the sound bender for the iPad two, three, four, and five. But I have the iPad pad two. Air and it already has like the speaker. It already has yeah, the stereo. So um, I tried it. It's okay. Let's now. Let's what see. do they advertise this as being able to do? It, it makes it, it just makes louder, it louder. Louder bends it toward your ear. Okay. Because when the iPads first came out, you had to like cup it right. to like turn right. it. But um, so that so I can understand how this could be useful. But this one. Um, or for example, if you're if you're like in a bed and you're leaning it up against the, uh, the right. sheets, yes. you're going to be blowing all the sound That's into the. That's true. Into the sheets. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I tried it out with a few different things. Let's see what it right sounds here. like. Put it, put it put right, right here. there. Okay. There we go. So that's that's a clip on. That's, the, it's magnetic. It's magnetic, okay. so it, cl it clips on, yeah. And then we'll see. Okay, now take it off. I just want to see if I. Uh -huh. Did you notice any difference? Um, no. I mean, I I am feeling a bit more funky, but that's not really changing the sound <laughs> level. And before they turned the cameras on, you were dancing too. I was I was dancing, but we can't <laughs> do that because I've been buried guard in several states. Yeah, that okay. So first test, I'm not saying great. Uh, maybe if it was muffled, uh, I, I would notice a difference, but I'm not really noticing any volume difference. Yeah, for the for the stereo speakers that are already on the iPad, I say, because I've seen it a bunch of different prices, over $20, $17.99, $8. Even $8, I think I'd probably use my hand if I really needed to make the sound <laughs> bigger. But um, for this iPad, I don't, oh. I don't know. Yeah, it, may, it sounds like this. Yeah, this was a product that made sense back in the older iPads right. before Apple realized. Oh, there's a lot of people complaining. Right. I honestly, I didn't notice any difference. No, I didn't either. Oh. Do you want to try it again? No, uh, give me a. Okay. Okay, now take it off. <laughs> Absolutely none whatsoever. <laughs> I didn't either, and I don't think I'm doing it wrong. I don't think because it's I mean, not. Um, Try it off the table. Okay. Oh, okay. Good point. Here, maybe you try, maybe, you maybe, try it. maybe the you try sound it. is bouncing off the table. All right. So here we go. Let's, let's try this one more time. Okay. Over here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I knew I could get you to dance. All right. I just had All right you now, with, now, with an iPad now magic. <laughs> okay. A tiny, like, like maybe half a decibel. Oh, I heard it that time. Yeah. Right. I def it's reflect. Right? It definitely is reflecting the sound. Okay. So so. Something, I guess. Yes. So if you're holding it, if you're walking around and you right. need to hear it, then maybe that works. Yeah. But if it's on a surface, probably not so much. Mm -hmm. So uh, the sound bender, try, buy. No. I would say try your hand. Try. <laughs> That's a polite, polite way to say it. <laughs> Megan Maroney, thank you very much. Of course, they'll find you every weekday here for Tech News Tonight yes. at 4 o'clock p.m. And you also do i5 for the iPhone and iOS Today. So yes. you're, you're kind of busy. And I'm hosting the screensavers. And you're Saturday. hosting, oh, oh, that's right. Tomorrow, 3 o'clock p.m. Mm -hmm. Pacific time, she's got, uh, she's got her first appointment with Destiny. I do. Her and Leo Laporte will be breaking down all the coolest, all the latest, and all the greatest on the screensavers. So make sure to drop in at live.twit.tv. 
uh, you you really don't want to miss it. It's been that's been a really good show. It's been developing so well over the last couple of weeks. It has been fun to watch. You did a great job hosting when Leo was gone. It was fun. It yeah. was fun. But I have to say, uh, I have no idea how Leo does does all those shows. <laughs> I did maybe like a third of his shows, yeah. and I was just exhausted. Yeah. So. But you did a great job. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Of course, we want to thank all of the people who gave us reviews. Of course, that includes Miriam Jawar. That includes Trey Ratcliffe. Uh, that includes you. And, of course, Lou Maresca. Uh, we, we couldn't do the show without you. So please keep doing reviews for us. Please. Okay. Geek out. Yeah, yeah. I will, if we, you do. We also want to thank those folks here at the Twit Brick House who make this show possible. That includes Lisa and Leo. That includes Karsten, our producer. And includes Zach. Well, I'm not going to give him an opportunity because every time I do this, he does something funny with the TriCaster. Instead, I'm going to say, don't forget to catch us every Friday. On the schedule, you'll find us at 2 o'clock. We almost never start at 2 o'clock. Usually, it's about 2.30 p.m. Pacific time every Friday. Come watch live. And as long as you're watching live, jump into the chat room at irc.twit.tv. That's all we have for this episode of Before You Buy. I'm Father Robert Balliser. And remember, you've got to listen before you buy. Go for it.